Well, one of the first things I learned was that when, when I was born, there was no Israel. So where did this come from? Well, what I discovered was that there was a movement uh, that began over a century ago and began operating in Europe and in the United States. It was, a, was and is a political movement that has profoundly and negatively impacted our country. It has tragically impacted the Middle East and it has dangerously impacted the entire world. And yet most of us, I think, have never heard of it and could certainly not define it. It's political Zionism. This was a movement to create a Jewish state in Palestine. It began in the late 1800s. Well, let us look at Palestine in the late 1800s. It was what we largely think of now as a somewhat multicultural land in that it was about 80% Muslim, about 15% Christian, and about 5% Jewish, all living together quite successfully. There are mosques, synagogues, uh, churches throughout Palestine, throughout the Middle East, and throughout North Africa. These populations had been living without conflict for centuries. But with this movement was, was created largely in Israel, uh, largely in Europe, and then taken up at the same time in the US, to create a Jewish state on land that was already inhabited, in which 95% were not Jewish. Therefore, this would involve, and this was known by the leadership, even though many followers didn't know it, this would mean that 95% of those people were going to be dispossessed by money, if possible, by force, if necessary. This was written in, in Zionist journals early on. Now, my book and my talk concentrates on the U.S. aspect of all of this. What surprised me in my research is how early and how active this movement was in the United States, a movement I'd never heard of, although I was born here, and my parents were born here, and some ancestors go back to the beginning. It turns out that this was a very significant movement long before my parents were born. And then by 1910, there were already 20,000 Zionists in the U.S. They included lawyers, professors, and businessmen. It was already in 1910 a movement to which congressmen listened. Then in 1912, we had a very significant development. A prominent lawyer named Louis Brandeis became a Zionist. Brandeis not only just be, didn't just become a Zionist, within about two years, he then became the head of world Zionism. This was, a pub, this was public, it's not some secret knowledge, it's just that most of us don't know it. And then within a few years, he was also a Supreme Court Justice, named by Woodrow Wilson. When you're a Supreme Court Justice, you're supposed to resign your various board memberships and affiliations because you're supposed to not have any conflict of interest but be neutral. So he did resign his leadership of world Zionism, but in reality, he continued it. He would receive reports in his Supreme Court chambers by his loyal lieutenants, and then he would give them directives to go out and to uh, follow in work for Zionism. And this is mentioned in a number of very reliable books. If you get my book, you'll see that my book is over half footnotes. It's all cited. By the way, one of his loyal lieutenants also went on to become a very prominent Supreme Court Justice, Felix Frankfurter. So I'd read that. That to me was shocking right there. But then I discovered something more. So I'll give you my citations for this next information so you can evaluate whether you find it reliable or not. I, the way I did my research is I, I would read books, then I would look at their footnotes to see where they had gotten that information. Then I would often get those books and read those footnotes and then order those books and read those footnotes and on and on. So one of the books that I read was re really a fairly uh, well-known one. Israel in the Mind of America, published by a very mainstream establishment publisher, and the author was a very mainstream author. 
He had been diplomatic correspondent for the New York Times. He had been at Harvard. He had written a number of well-regarded, very establishment nonfiction books. Well, in this book, he had a few pages in which he told about a secret Zionist society that had operated in the United States of which Louis Brandeis, while a Supreme Court justice, had been a leader. So I looked at where he got that information, and I went to that source. It turned out to be from a scholarly journal called the American Jewish Historical Quarterly, a very respected journal. So then I looked at the author. Well, is this a reliable author? Who wrote this very, to me, explosive information and turned out to be a, a well-regarded Israeli historian? at a, a mainstream uh, Israeli university. She had written an article in 1975 called The Parashim, a secret episode in American Zionist history. Uh, and she told about what this was, an elitist secret society. The word meant Pharisees and separate. They would go around the country and influence people to push this Zionist agenda. By the way, at this time, the Jewish population were not Zionists at all. The large majority were not Zionists. Many were opposed to Zionism. This was a, a very, very fringe uh, element to a certain regard. Then in this secret society, they even had a secret induction ceremony. So that when somebody joined this society, and many, their membership included professors and Harvard, you know, recent Harvard graduates, and, uh, doctors, significant people around the country were sometimes members. And in the initiation ceremony, they were told by the inductor, and they swore to this, until our purpose shall be accomplished, you will be the fellow of a brotherhood whose bond you will regard as greater than any other in your life, dearer than that of family, of school, of nation. As early as November 1915, a leader of the Parashim went around suggesting that the British might gain some benefit from a formal declaration in support of a Jewish national homeland in Palestine. Those of you who have heard of the Balfour Declaration that came in 1917 might find this relevant. I'll get into that a little bit more. Let's remember what was going on during this time period now in the world, especially that involved Britain? Well, of course, in 1914 began what was called at that time the Great War of massive carnage. British forces in the first day of the Battle of the Somme lost, according to historians, somewhere around 50,000 to 60,000 men in one day of a battle that went on and on and on. The British and the German, both sides of course, wanted the US to come in on their side to join this carnage. But the American population were that bad thing, they were isolationists. They didn't want to go kill and be killed in a foreign pointless war. In fact, Woodrow Wilson was elected with the slogan, he kept us out of the war. But of course, as you know, with hindsight, no, he didn't. Well, what happened is that the, the Zionists' leaders, some of them, in Britain, a man named Chaim Weizmann, who is quite well known, went to the British government and said, well, we can help you win this war. Now, why would they want to do that? Because the war wasn't just against Germany, it was against the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire uh, held Palestine. Palestine was under, under the Ottoman Empire. So by defeating them, the British would, would come into control of, of Palestine. So the Zionists went to the British and said, we can help you get the United States into the war. Our, our Zionist colleagues in the United States, for example, they said in writing, Louis Brandeis, who is close to President Wilson, can help to do that. In exchange for that, the British did issue a declaration that was quite significant, mild as it may sound. It was really considered a gentleman's agreement 
This is written about in a number of books. Just most of us don't know this about our own history. So the Balfour Declaration was basically a promise that the British would help to facilitate the Zionist objective of creating a Jewish state in Palestine. After the British, of course, did win, then at the Paris peace talks, the Zionists pushed to uh, push this wording into the mandate in which Britain took charge of <laughs> Then jumping ahead to some of the American aspects again, then we find during the 30s and the 40s, in Palestine itself, there were some, the violence increased. Naturally, as soon, you know, when there was colonization beginning around the turn of the century to a land with the intention of pushing out the land, the indigenous population at some point is going to wake, out, wake up and there will be violence. That has happened in the early 20s and again in 1929. There was violence between the two populations. Then, uh, then as now, the large number of those killed were the Palestinians. So as the violence increased, there were some terrorist organizations created in Palestine by the Zionists. One of them led by a former, in fact, two of them led by future Israeli prime ministers. And uh, those, those terrorist organizations in Palestine, the Irgun and the Stern Gang, it turns out had front groups in the United States with duplicitous names. And they were funneling massive amounts of money and weaponry to these terror groups in Palestine. They put on major pageants where Supreme Court justices attended and thousands of people attended. They were very prominent. One of them was led by a, a man named Peter Bergson, people thought. His real name was Hillel Cook. He was the operative for the Irgun. I looked into one of the leaders a bit more, just, just because I needed to find out his first name. When you're writing a book, you can't just write someone's last name, you need to know their first name. And I had heard about another leader of, of one of these types of front groups connected to killing in Palestine. And uh, his name was Rabbi Korf, but I didn't know the first name. None of the books that I had had a few paragraphs of them, but none of them gave his first name. So I looked into it on the internet, tried to do various searches, and eventually I came up with a UN report that gave his, his first name, Baruch Korf, and told a little bit about a plot he was part of. Using those search terms, I then could just, you know, put in more information into my search bar, and suddenly all these PDFs of American newspapers popped up, all of these returns. It turned out that Rabbi Baruch Korf was part of a, a, a cell in Paris that was planning to fly an airplane and bomb Britain after the war. Britain that had just defeated Hitler. But they were so angry at the British because the British were not allowing a, a large enough Jewish immigration into Palestine. So they were going to kill the British. So Baruch Korf and his section of the Stern Gang had this plan, but there was one problem. They, they didn't know how to fly an airplane. They weren't pilots. So they needed to find somebody, and they recruited a young American aviator named Reginald Gilbert, I discovered. Reginald Gilbert had been an ace during the war. He was in Paris, and they recruited him to fly the airplane for them. He pretended to go along with the plot, but then he went to the American Embassy, and the American Embassy ins informed the Paris police and Scotland Yard. So for a week, he pretended to go along with this cell, and then when it came time to actually take off, to fly the plane, to drop these uh, incendiary bombs onto the foreign ministry, they were caught. By the way, the original plan had been to bomb Parliament, but then they decided they hated the foreign ministry more. And Gilbert at one point had said to them, well, what if I can't find the foreign ministry in, in the London fog? They didn't have this you know, degree of instrumentation we have today, and that was a real possibility. And they said, then just drop them anywhere. Kill anybody. All, of, all British are our enemy. So they were caught. 
Korf was in prison for a few months in Paris, and he eventually got off. He had very powerful friends in the United States. But I was curious about him. I looked into him some more. To, you know, this was so astounding to me, and none of these, you know, dozens and dozens of books I have, none of them had, any, had this story in there at all. And so in looking at him, I discovered that later in life, he was a friend of Richard Nixon. In fact, it was reported that he had helped to influence Nixon's policies on the Middle East. In fact, Nixon sort of in a fond way called him my rabbi. Now the precursor to today's very powerful Israel lobby was a group called the American Zionist Emergency Council, AZEC. Uh, this was formed in around 1940, and by 1943 had a budget of half a million dollars at a time when a nickel bought a loaf of bread. Within a few years, they had maneuvered their way into access to an even far larger sum in which they had access to $14 million in 1941 and $150 million by 1948. That's the equivalent in today's dollars of a trillion dollars to use to manipulate the United States. So they targeted with that money every sector of US society. Uh, and you know, this isn't ancient history. They had annual reports, they had directives, you know, all this was written down on paper. They targeted congressmen, Christian clergy, editors, professors, business and labor, Jewish war veterans. They published uh, books all over. They had 400 local committees. There were massive campaigns throughout the country. They also worked especially to manufacture Christian support. They s uh, secretly funded sort of Christian groups that would push the same Zionist ideology. They uh, funded books that became huge bestsellers. It was a, an em enormously successful campaign throughout the country. Even though during this time there was a great deal of opposition to Zionism by many different groups, by Christian leaders, by State Department, Pentagon, intelligence agencies, Jewish anti-Zionists, many people were opposed to it. Two of the most celebrated Christian pastors opposed it on religious and moral grounds. Uh, the Christian leaders in the Middle East had gone to the Paris Peace Talks to advocate on behalf of the Arab population that there should be self-determination of peoples there. 